We are at the very end of Romans chapter 10, going into Romans chapter 11. Matter of fact, we're on the last verse of chapter 10. It's verse 21. So Romans 10, 21. But to Israel, he says, this is God saying this, all day long I have stretched out my hand to a disobedient and contrary people. Now, we are in a section in Romans where Paul is... Uh, citing or quoting various verses, prophecies, verses, or uh, just statements that are proving a point, proving, proving a point. That one, one is going to be that uh, Israel is His people. Israel belongs to God. God, uh, that, that if He had a nation, and He does, Israel is His nation. But, Israel was also disobedient. And that does not mean that every one of them were. Because we have Paul, who's not disobedient. Paul has obeyed Christ. And we have many, we have others that we can name, uh, from uh, beginning with, uh, obviously, uh, Mary, and then Mary and Martha. And we have that of Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and, and uh, uh, the other apostles besides Judas that um, uh, all of them are Jewish. And then we can go further on to someone like Timothy, who his father was, no, I'm sorry, his mother was Jewish, his father was Gentile. (coughs) But there is something being stated here, that while he had a rebellious people, there was always a remnant. And he's making mention of this. Uh, and he's also making mention concerning uh, the prophecies of the Gentiles, that the Gentiles would be brought in to the gospel. While they are, uh, the, the law of Moses is not intended for the Gentiles, not intended for them at all, they're not under it, but the law of Christ is. The law of Christ is for everyone. The law of Moses is done away with at the cross. The law of Christ comes into being and now everyone is under that law. But to Israel, he says, so this is Isaiah 65, 2, All day long I have stretched out my hand to a disobedient and contrary people. That he was patient and long-suffering with them. That time after time after time, he had to deal with the things that they were up to. And they were up to a lot of no good. And it's nothing, absolutely nothing unique to Israel except that they are His people. All right? they, are, they, they are His nation. There's nothing unique about their disobedience. Nothing at all. It's not as though Israel's the only one who's ever disobedient, <laughs> if, if that were only the case. But that's not the case. But He was always patient with them. And we can see going uh, from uh, Exodus forward in in this that uh, even at exodus he can bring them through out of egypt he can bring them through the red sea they could see the power of god working for them protecting them they can even be fed by manna in the middle of the wilderness to where they're not farming they're not buying food there's no, really no place to farm, and there is no place to buy. They're in the middle of the wilderness. And He is sheltering them, helping them, feeding them, and yet they can murmur and complain about Him in all of this. Well, that's what humans do. There's no excuse, but that's what we tend to do. That while God is doing something extremely good for us, we complain against Him at just any kind of, just whatever, uh, just, just little minute things, but whatever it happens to be. But we go into uh, the days of the judges and the disobedience there. We go into the days of the kings and the disobedience there and the divided kingdom and the, the wicked kings and the wickedness that was, that was there and the Assyrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity. Through it all, God did protect them, of which he, they, they're never destroyed. They're never 
completely destroyed, there's always a remnant. There's always some, and he's going to be proving that. Now, chapter 11. All right, he asks this question. I say then, has God cast away his people? After all these things have been said, you have a rebellious people, you have a people that will not accept him, that they will not accept the Christ, which if you don't accept the Christ, you don't accept the Godhead. They will not accept the Christ. As a whole, they won't do it. Has he cast away his people? And the words are certainly not. Certainly not. Now, for the Jews, this is a, this is a exceedingly good message because he's not cast them away. It may seem as he has, as though he has, but he, he hasn't. He hasn't cast them away. They were the, the first ones to receive the, go, the gospel. Therefore, they are the first ones to, as a nation, reject it. And it goes to the Gentiles. But has he cast away his people? Just because it went to the Gentiles, did he toss away the Jewish nation? No, he didn't. He did not. And I will take these words, certainly not, in the same way that we have all the way through the book, whenever he's used, he's asked a rhetorical question and then answered in a very emphatic way, em with emphasis or, or in, in the most strong, the strongest way. Certainly not. That means he never did, nor will he ever. He's not going to cast away his people. Cast away his people means he's not going to destroy them on the earth. Now, that is completely destroy them. He has punished them in numerous ways all the way through their history. He's punished them for disobedience. Now, he doesn't destroy them completely to where they are obliterated and there are no more on the earth. But this certainly not means he's not done it in the past and he's never going to do it in the future. All right, he's not, he's not going to do it. And the good news for the Jewish nation and for Jews around the world, wherever they may be, is that God in this, and it is in the New Testament, that God is not going to completely destroy the Jews ever. I take it from, from the Greek meaning by what, we, uh, what has been um, uh, translated here, certainly not, but the meaning of the Greek is not, uh, it's not possible, nor will it ever be possible. It's never been done, nor will it ever be done. Now, someone of the Jewish nation, or the entire Jewish nation itself, can rebel against God, and they have, rebel against God, receive punishment for it, but uh, they've got to be saved just like everybody else. God is no respecter of persons, and this is what Romans has been emphasizing again and again. Everybody is the same under the gospel. Everyone is the same. That there is no uh, one special people, and then there's the others. There's, there's second-class citizens. There are no second-class citizens here. There's, there's not the beloved and the less loved. Everyone is loved. Christ died for all. He didn't just die for the Jewish nation only. Them and the rest of us. And the rest of us, which is a theme that has been running through all of Romans, every bit of Romans. But he says, certainly not. For I also, in here, he's proving it. Has God cast away his people? Now he's going to prove it. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. If he's thrown, if he's thrown the Jewish nation away, then Paul would have been thrown away. And why not throw him away? I mean, that's a good question. Why not throw him away? What was he doing at Acts chapter 9? The beginning of Acts chapter 9, what's he doing? He's persecuting the church. All right, that's not taking an apathetic view. That's not taking a neutral view. That's taking an active, <laughs> uh, being active in destroying the church. That's what, and why not throw Paul away or Saul of Tarsus? But God doesn't. He will use 
Paul or Saul of Tarsus for a very powerful means of where he's going to be and he becomes a, an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, he's also going to prove it in this next point. He proves it personally. Okay, he's saying, has, has God cast away his people? Well, I'm, I'm one of them. I'm of the seed of Abraham. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Then he's going to prove it in another way, and it has to do with Elijah going back to 2 Kings, or sorry, 1 Kings. 1 Kings 19. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. He knew what He was going to do before, before the earth began. And we often talk about uh, knowing what the Christ had to do from eternity, knowing the church from eternity. But to get to those points, there has to be a nation where the Christ is going to be born. That's going to be Israel. He had, so that had to be foreknown. God had to foreknow that as well. That had to be from eternity. So, God has not cast away the, His people whom He foreknew? Or do you not know what the Scripture says of Elijah, how he pleaded with God against Israel, saying... Now Israel, I'm sorry, Elijah would have cast away Israel and the rest of the world for that matter. Elijah would have done it. Verse 3, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. So who did that? The Gentiles? Or an Israelite king and Israelites. Well, the Gentiles weren't doing it. Matter of fact, there's more kindness toward Elijah from a Sidonian widow than he ever received from the king and queen of Israel. All right, she housed him, she fed him with her son. They were, uh, she, she protected him and provided for him, and God provided for her in that time, but there's more kindness from a Sidonian. That's, she's Phoenician. She's not an Israelite. She's a Gentile. But he's saying, they have killed your prophets, torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. So this is 1 Kings 9, this is 10 and 14. And what is his solution? His solution is let's end it all. But what's the answer? The answer comes from God. But what does the divine response say to him? Something very surprising to Elijah. I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. All right, Israel is not completely wicked. Some are. But there are some who are among the righteous. They are not behaving like Ahab and Jezebel. They're not, they're not among the prophets of Baal or supporting the prophets of Baal or worshiping Baal or giving lip service to Baal. They're not doing any of those things. They've not bowed the knee to Baal at all. And there's 7,000 of them. While Elijah would cast them away, God says, I've got 7,000 here. Why would I do that? I've got 7,000. And here is information that Elijah simply cannot know. Elijah's a prophet. Elijah's a righteous man. Elijah's also an emotional man. He is that, and he's been through a lot. And his response is, let it all go. Let it all end. But God says, no. And while Elijah would want his life to end with everything else, God has a plan for Elijah as well. And he's showing the things that he wants Elijah to do. While Elijah is saying, they've killed your prophets, they've torn down your altars, what he doesn't know is there are 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal, and there's also someone, and his name is Elisha, and he's going to replace you. All right? There's, there's an Elisha. You're, you're not the only one at all. Now, what Paul is bringing in this, and let's give the credit to whom credit belongs. It's the Holy Spirit who is inspiring this. What the Holy Spirit is bringing in this is that there is a remnant of the Jews that will always be righteous to God. They will always, for every Caiaphas, 
a wicked high priest, there is a Saul of Tarsus. For every, just every scribe and every Sadducee, you're going to find a Mary and a Martha. That the Jews are accepted and some do accept. And they are expected to do, we're all expected to, but they are the ones where all the energy was put in all those centuries and then the energy coming out from that, the providence, the, the, the oracles of God and all the things, that all the lessons, everything coming up to bring us all to the Christ. Okay, now I'll just say that uh, in my life, I have met uh, Jewish men and women who uh, were extremely secular. They didn't care a thing about religion whatsoever. I've met Jewish men and women who were religious, but they rejected Christ. They continued with the best they could, and that's all you can do, best they could in observing the Old Testament. And of course, you can't, okay? You can't. You don't have a priesthood. You don't have a temple. You can't make sacrifices. How are you possibly going to go to Jerusalem every year for Passover and Pentecost? How are you going to do that? You can't do these things. You can't. But they cling on to it anyway, precisely as Christ said some would. But I've also met uh, Jewish men and women who they were members of the church. Matter of fact, uh, there was a, a man, he was, uh, he was Jewish as far as his lineage is concerned. He was Jewish, member of the church, and a, uh, a preacher. Actually, he was a preaching student at the time. And it was partly because of him, partly because of him, that I even decided to go into preaching. It's partly because of him. Not entirely, but seeing him and him being a preaching student and just uh, meeting him at a chance encounter um, and uh, at just uh, something, I, I didn't know what was going to be there, who was going to be there, but, uh, but God has not cast away his people. And he's cast away nobody, as a matter of fact. He's cast away nobody. He... Uh, Christ died for a reason, and that is an extraordinary sacrifice to be limited to just, as I guess last week maybe we were saying, I don't know when it was, to, to just, just his friends or to just uh, those who were nice to him. That it's, it's an extraordinary sacrifice that is for everybody. It's for everybody, but it's a matter of us accepting it. Now, let's go to verse 4. But here's the response again. But what does the divine response say to him? What, is, what does God say to Elijah? I've reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. That's 1 Kings 19, 18. Even so then, at this present time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. And while this is written in the first century, it's still true today. It's still true today. That even so at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. That, that if we're talking about the Jews, they're still here. And there still would be those who are, well, they come to Christ. They see what the, the prophets said in the Old Testament and they see that it's pointing to Jesus of Nazareth. They believe those prophets, therefore they, they follow Christ. They follow the Messiah. That's what they do. As opposed to those who twist those old prophecies, those prophecies from David or from Isaiah or from 
all from Moses, from all these, of, of changing those, changing the meaning of them. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's so terribly changed that they've become really meaningless. The fact of the matter is that if the Messiah didn't come in the first century under the Roman Empire, he's not coming. Uh, it's, it's that simple. As a matter of fact, the, the prophecies are so specific that if the Christ did not come in the first century under the Roman Empire in Palestine, so that's, that's time and place, if He doesn't come then, He can't come at all. It, the prophecies don't hold. The prophecies uh, were false or they failed. But the prophecies pointing to a specific time, a specific place, when this would occur, and there we have Jesus of Nazareth, ex right on time, right at the exact spot he's supposed to be. Pre it just absolute the precision of God. Now, there is this election of grace, verse 6, and if by grace, then it is no longer of grace works. Let's not, and we've been saying this time and time again, let's not take a verse out of the book of Romans without the rest of the message of Romans. Let's not take, take out a verse and then make it say what it doesn't say. You wouldn't want anybody doing that to you, so let's not do it to God. But here, under the context of all this, you know, what, what sort of works are we even talking about? You don't even know. You take this out, you don't even know what grace we're talking about. Or you take this out, you can't know the grace, you can't know the works, you can't know anything. But let's put it in by the grace of Christ. And we are talking Christ. So if by grace, that means if by Christ, it's no longer of works. That would be the works of the Old Testament. Those works. So these things are ex mutually, as we would say, mutually exclusive. You can't have one and the other. It's either one or the other. You can't have them both at the same time. It's one or the other. So he's saying that if it's by grace, if it's by the grace of Christ, it's not by the works of the Old Testament. It's not by the works of the law of Moses. It can't be. And he's also going to say if it's by the works of the law of Moses, then it can't be of Christ. That's what he's saying. If, if this is all it took, just the, the law of Moses, then there's no reason to bring in the Christ at all. There's no reason to. So now let's read it. If by grace, then it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Yes, that would mean that what Christ came to bring is pointless and of no use. If we could keep ourselves flawless there would be no need for grace. But if we could keep ourselves flawless, you know what? We wouldn't have had to have any of those sacrifices that we see beginning in Genesis chapter 4. We wouldn't have to have those. If we were flawless, we would not have to have the, the, all those sacrifices in the Old Testament because they every one of them, whether it's prior to Sinai or after Sinai, every one of them was foreshadowing the Christ. Every single one of them foreshadowing Him. And if they could take away sins, there's no need for the Christ at all. If they could do it, there's no need for Him. If we could keep, and if we could keep ourselves perfect, there's no need for the Christ. There's no need for grace. If we could work our way into heaven, then we don't need Christ at all. And we don't need His grace. Continuing on. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Okay? If it's work, then, uh, then we, don't, we don't need, once again, we don't need that grace. And uh, the works that we have are 
more than just works. They are the entrance into heaven. They are more than, than uh, just uh, uh, what they, they might, uh, what they would, uh, would be. They're more than that. It would be able to not need the Christ at all. It's greater than that. Grace and any kind of meritorious work exclude each other. Grace, Christ, and also the obedience to the Old Testament cannot be at the same time. You cannot have obedience to the Old Testament and obedience to the New Testament simultaneously. You close one and you go to the, the next. That's what you do. That's what was to be done, and we see that by those who are obedient to Christ. That's exactly what Paul did, who's writing this, and those other names that we mentioned earlier. Verse 7, what then... Israel has not obtained what it seeked, what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now, did God blind them? And the answer is certainly not. He did not blind them. All we have to do is go to places like John chapter 6, and we see. A man, and here's, it's, it's a story of, of tremendous hypocrisy and irony, as a matter of fact, of Christ heals a blind man, and he can now see. The blind man can now see. And there is this investigation, this official investigation of, are we sure he was blind? Okay, and if he was blind... How does he now see? Because we can all tell he can see. Everybody can, can tell this, that he can see. they got to bring his parents in. His parents say, yeah, he was born blind. He's always been blind. How he came to see, we don't know. He's at least 40 by now. You ask him. Ask him. He'll tell you. And they don't really want the answer. They want a denial concerning Christ, to deny Christ, not to admit that Christ, by the power of God, did this. They don't want that. So you have a man who was literally blind, now being able to see, and those who, they, their eyes work just fine. They can see, but they make themselves blind. They don't want to see. They want to, to cover the truth up, to obscure the truth, where they cannot, they're just going to, to claim that uh, this is, this, is, this didn't happen. All right? It didn't happen the way they said it happened. Uh, there's, there's something else in this. It cannot be the working of God. Well, everything about it shows it's got to be from God. When did Satan care about healing anybody? When did he care about that? Well, uh, never. All right? uh, there's nothing beneficial about him. There's nothing benevolent about him. Uh, kind or gracious or loving or anything about him. He doesn't do such a thing. Now, the rest were blinded. So you have some, you consider, well, let's just read uh, verse 7 again. What then? Israel has not t obtained what it seeks. What does it seek? Well, it would seek a continuation of Judaism, that'd be one thing, but it also seeks a Messiah in its image, not in the image of God, not as God would be the Messiah, but a Messiah that is more like them and what they want, as we've said before. Uh, they were looking for someone who's going to be a very powerful political force, who's going to be on a throne in Jerusalem and cast out all the Gentile powers, cast them all out, and rule on the earth. That's what they were looking for. And Israel being now this extraordinary place, it's extraordinary power with the Messiah on the throne there. That was their idea in 
uh, uh, I'm sorry, did I say John 6? or this? That was John 9. John 6 is where they wanted to make him king. They were going to force him to be king. They, want, they were going to demand that he be king. But that's not the kind of Messiah that God sent. He didn't send the Christ for that purpose. They didn't get what they sought. But the elect have obtained it. How did they do it? The elect, what made them elect? Well, they answered the call. That's what made them elect. They were obedient to Christ. That's what made them elect. It's by their desiring and receiving with, through obedience the grace of Christ. That's how they became elect. They did see it. They did obtain it. But the rest were blinded. They wanted to be that way. Verse 8, just as, as it is written, and we're continuing this, this um, uh, Paul bringing in one scripture after another. So it's Isaiah 29.10 now. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And once again, uh, that was true in the first century, and it's still true today. Let's go to Isaiah 29. And we'll begin in verse 9. Isaiah 29 and verse 9. Pause and wonder. Blind yourselves and be blind. Uh, that, those are the words. Blind yourselves and be blind. God's not doing this to you. You're doing it. You go and suppress the truth. Well, God's not suppressing the truth. You're doing it. Go ahead and despise, hate the truth. God's not making you hate the truth. You're doing that. He's showing you the truth. You just don't want it. So blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. They, st they stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets, and he has covered your heads, namely the seers. Okay, so you have false prophets, false seers. You have the people who have blinded themselves. And here they are under this spirit of deep sleep, as it were, of wanting to ignore, wanting to uh, just not have to deal with reality. And the reality is, well, they're in sin and they need to return back to God. And the things that they want to be free to do, they're not free to do. The things that they would do with the, very, with the sins in their lives, uh, God doesn't never, never permit it at all. Uh, now we come back to, to Romans 11. And uh, he's given them, a, uh, in verse 8, he's given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see. Now we come to verse 9, and David says, this is Psalm 69, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let, let these things, let these things become their trap. The things that, the, in, in we could talk about the materialistic things. Let the materialistic things become their trap. Their place in society, their place in the synagogue, uh, their, uh, uh, the wealth that they may have, the, the various friendships they may have, all these things, the social pressure in there as well. Let that all become a trap to them. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be at all. It's a matter of letting go of not caring and uh, wanting the, the, to please God rather than to please men. Wanting to, uh, Him, wanting Him and uh, wanting uh, His acceptance, not the acceptance of men. And fearing Him, not, not fearing men. But their table becomes a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Verse 10, let their eyes be darkened so they do not see and bow down their back always. Once again, Psalm 69, that's verses 22 and 23. 
I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Okay, that means fall and never give, get up. That they can't get up. And he comes back with this again. Certainly not. That yes, while they can fall, it's not so that they will remain down. Once they have fallen, that they can never return back to God. There's always a return back to God while you're on this earth. There's always a return to God while you live this life. Did they fall? Yes, they did, because he's about to say that they did. Okay? In the very next phrase, but through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. All right, so the Jews are key in this, by the way. If you haven't realized this, let's, let's do so. The Jews are key in this. They were the first ones where the gospel was sent. The first ones where the Christ was sent. If he's going to be born on this earth, he's got to be born to someone. And that someone is going to be part of a some people of some nation. And God chose Israel, the descendants of Abraham. That's who he chose. And by way of his promise to Abraham, going all the way back to Genesis 12. That's what's going to happen. But they fell. But it wasn't a fall where they can't rise back up, where they can't return back to God. They always could return back to God. How many times in the Old Testament do we have a prophet writing about corrections that need to be made? How many times? And there's even points where it is uh, words from a prophet and these are the things that you need to do, but you're not even going to do them. You're not going to do them at all. Some will, but as a whole, you're not going to do it. And time and time again, God gave that message. And the same message is today. Return to God. Return to Him. Now it's through the Christ now we have something far better than what they had in the past, prior to Christ. We have something far greater than that. Now, we go to, just again to verse 11, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, I don't know if we read this last week, but let's read it now. Let's go to Acts chapter 13. And we'll just begin in verse 42. And we may have read this last week, but it, we need to read it again anyway. And this is uh, Paul and Barnabas. They are on the first missionary journey. And wherever they will go, wherever they go, if there's a synagogue, they go to the synagogue first because that's a, that's a splendid strategy. They, more than the Gentiles, would have, they know who Jehovah is. They know there's a Christ. There's supposed to be a Christ. They know the prophecies. Now, the Gentiles don't necessarily know that. Uh, by and large, they wouldn't have, have quite understood what that was. And, and you couldn't, uh, discuss the, the finer points of those of, of uh, what Moses said or, or what uh, Joel may have said or what Daniel may have said. You couldn't do that with them. So you go to the, the Jews first. Then you go to the Gentiles, which is what they did. Now we see in verse 42, So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them next Sabbath. So here is... Uh, Paul and Barnabas, they're in that synagogue, and we, we can read Paul's sermon to them. We can read that. And so it was so well received, but then the Gentiles beg. There, there are Gentiles in the synagogue. And in our life of Paul, we have been discussing that. That uh, not every Gentile was pagan. And there were some like Cornelius, who we know by name, uh, there were some who were, uh, they saw something different with uh, the God of the Old Testament. So they asked, can come back next Sabbath? 
And when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. All right, this is precisely the parable that Jesus gives. There is a very wealthy, prominent man who is going to have a feast. And it is something, it would be a once-in-a-lifetime event. Nothing's going to match it before or after. And there are those, there, there are invited guests. There are invited guests. And it would be an absolute honor to be invited to that dinner. A, an honor to be there. To have your name in the invitations. But one by one, they began to make excuses. And they weren't going to go. Some of them weren't going to go. And so you have the messengers coming back, the servants coming back and saying, they're not coming. Then there is the call from the wealthy man. Then you go out and you bring in others. You bring in whomever you can find. I'm not going to have this house. I'm not going to have this hall. I'm not going to have my mansion not filled. It's going to be filled. So you go out everywhere else, everywhere else you can find them. You bring them in. And surely you're going to find some who aren't going to be giving excuses. They're going to be happy to be in here. They're going to be happy to be here. And we see from that parable that Jesus is describing His church accurately. And what would happen in the first century, starting at the first century, accurately. That's exactly what happened. And here we see it happening. This is Antioch of Pisidia. We're seeing it happen here. That you've judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Okay, we go to the Gentiles. We go to the Gentiles because someone is going to hear this and everyone needs to hear it. You, you don't want it? Fine. You don't want it. But we're, going, we're not stopping. We're going to go to the Gentiles. Now, with the, the, those men and women who were blaspheming and contradicting, it's not enough for them to say, I don't want it. They don't want anybody else to have it either. Uh, they've, they've made themselves into something else. They've made themselves into uh, what the, the Pharisees, scribes and the Pharisees had made themselves into or wanted to be, and that is basically the keepers of the gates of heaven. They're not going in, but they're not, they don't want anybody else going in either. And, uh, and so, with coming back to, to uh, Romans chapter 11, uh, with all this, verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So it goes to the Gentiles too. And there is a hope in all that, that from that, they would be, the Jews would be willing to follow suit. Jews would be willing to follow the very Messiah they've been teaching all those centuries. And uh, we'll just read verse 12. Now, if their fall is riches to the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Okay. Just because they fail or they failed doesn't mean that uh, if they had not failed, that 
the, the Gentiles would have been, just been left out in the cold, that the rest of us would have been left out in the cold. It doesn't mean that at all. That it, there would just been a, a greater abundance of teachers going out into the world, a, 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 an abundance of them, and things would have been much, much different in the history of the world had that occurred. But it didn't occur. But he said they fell, it went to the Gentiles faster that way. It went to the Gentiles, but if they, if they had not, or if they don't, it's, they're still key. They're still key in this. And uh, that they were the first target. They were the first ones to be taught, and then the rest of us. And um, no one is to be neglected. But I want to thank everybody for being with us this morning. And uh, hopefully we can continue in Romans chapter 11 next week.